This is Around the Farm, the podcast about all things ag. I'm your host, Tom Versman, and today we're meeting with Chris Bornstrom, a channel seedsman. Let's get right into it. Well, hey, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself for those who haven't met you and uh, a little bit about who you are. Yeah, so I'm Chris Bornstrom. I uh, grew up in a small town on the southeast corner of Wyoming called Five Bluffs. I um, lived here my entire life, except for while I was in college, but shortly after I returned. So um, pretty much my whole life, I've either been on my fitness farm or in a basketball gym. Um, to this day, I'm still in those two places, working for the farm and coaching basketball. Now that I'm a bit too old to play, I guess. So... <laughs> Went to the University of Wyoming for four years, um, got my bachelor's and master's degree from that university and spent a lot of great time in Larry. When I went to college, I was pretty sure I was gonna be done with the farm for at least a little while. I wanted to get a job in the corporate finance world. But the more I went through school and the more summers I spent away from the farm and the more opportunities I missed at home, I just knew that I was ready to return back to the farm when I finished school and wanted to come help contribute to everything my family that's built in our town and on our farm and for our community. So as soon as I graduated and I made it home, I um, immediately started helping in the office during the winters and helping farm and uh, during the summers. So that's kind of where my journey's brought me so far. And I'm just really happy to be back. I started as a seedsman pretty much the moment I got back from college as well. So that's been my newest adventure. And I'm really excited to see where it goes from here. Yeah, so you said a couple things there, you know, actually three things that, that jumped out to me. You know, the first one, wh where are you coaching? Who are you coaching for or where are you coaching from a basketball perspective? Yep, so I coach uh, I coach the junior high basketball program in Pine for the boys team. Um, I, as a student at the university, I was a student manager for three years. Um, for the men's basketball program, which is a great opportunity. I got to work under division one coaches like Alan Edwards and uh, Jeff Linder. So it really kind of drove my decision to be a coach when I was got to finish school and got back home and had the perfect opportunity to coach for this first, this was my first year. So really got to dive into it. And well, that's great. Great to hear. The second one, um, if, I, if I heard you right, you're, you had a little bit of a financial stint or that was your thought process at least after you went to college what what were you thinking you you would do um and shoot would you even live in wyoming with that potential career path that you almost took um yeah so i was going to be a financial advisor or i wanted to be a financial advisor uh, which there is just as much opportunity for that in wyoming as anywhere um of course if you really want to probably hit it big you got to move somewhere and that was part of what was enticing about it to me I've lived in Pine Bluffs my whole life, uh, except for my couple years in college. So, you know, I really wanted to go see the world and do something else for at least a few years before I returned home. But it, it was never so much about not liking corporate finance or anything like that as much as just missing the farm and knowing where I belonged. And that was back home. Gotcha. I just didn't know if you're going to be like, yeah, New York was the place I wanted to be, right? Or, or the West Coast was really what I was thinking. So no, that's, that's great. And then sounds like an awesome journey. And can you can you touch on a little bit more your journey so far as a channel seedsman? So that's a that's a pretty cool path that you've stepped into, especially with your other hobbies that are going along with it. Yeah, so uh, my family has been exclusively growing channel corn for about four years. Um, and we grew some corn from channel before that. Uh, but we've always had a really great relationship with uh, our FSR, who pretty much dealt with our seedsmen for that entire time period, David Lerwick. Um, so as I was going through school, I was always hitting him up about opportunities for maybe doing internships and stuff. And uh, although we never really got around to figuring that out, he did push me to be a seedsman that entire time uh, and just told me how great it would be to CB co home and not only join the family farm, but to kind of expand on that with, uh, you know, being a part of channel. So David encouraged me to do it. Uh, my dad and um, my uncle, who's my dad's business partner in the farm, they both really encouraged me to do it and saw the value in it. So that led me to, you know, finding channel and becoming a seedsman. So this is my first year selling now, and I'm just really excited to see how the first year goes. 
No, that's awesome. And and we we don't want to butter David up too much, but he he is a really really good guy. So I'm I'm glad I'm glad he was able to uh, to bring you on board. And no, ex- really excited to see uh, where everything goes with you and, and kind of follow the journey with you too. Um, you know what's kind of exciting is year one, right? Season one, give or take, as a as a channel seedsman. But you also got another project going on along with it. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with Pine Bluffs Distilling? Yeah. Yep. So um, the, the Pine Bluffs Distilling um, it's a fairly new distillery. It's been around about six or seven years now. Um, it's located in my hometown, uh, as the name would suggest, and. A couple of years ago, they approached us and asked us if we would be interested in growing the, um, non-GMO corn for them, which is something that, you know, we don't do a whole lot of, um, but we were happy to give it a try, especially for this new business in our town. So we've been growing uh, non-GMO corn, which is Chale variety 19206 for about three years for them. Uh, we're the exclusive corn supplier for them. Uh, moving forward with that, we saw the value in the distillery, both to our community and to our farming operations. So we decided to invest in the business and become uh, minority owners as well. So we grow the corn for them. Uh, we own part of the distillery and we just like to stay involved with it as much as we can because it's it's brought a lot of value to both our town and the state as a whole. Um, the entire distillery just kind of resembles Wyoming and that's what we love about it. No, that's great. And I, I just kind of down here, I happen to have maybe a, a sample here of what y'all are doing. Maybe you could talk a little bit about this uh, for me when you when you think of some of the pretty unique things you're doing with Channel Corn. Yeah. Um, so Pine Bluffs Distilling is uh, historically one of the things they do great is they love to work with small businesses and find ways to promote them uh, through co-labeling, I guess I would call it. Um, so using part of our label, but also throwing on another brand as well to really make it, you know, two businesses coming together to explain the story. So, you know, as most seedsmen or most farmers know, part of uh, doing business is getting a gift for a grower at the end of the year or, you know, saying thanks by providing someone a Carver sweatshirt or anything. And one of the gifts my farm has gotten a lot over the years is whiskey. Uh, so as we were kind of talking through what special things we could do for growers. Like, well, we're already providing our own channel corn to this distillery. Why don't we just get the growers whiskey that has their own corn in it? I mean, the corn they're growing in it, at least. So it it just tells a story, I think, when you give it to a grower. Uh, it says channel on it. It gives a little story on the background of the bottle. And it's really just a good opportunity to show them um, how lovable a product is and it's it's a great way to say thank you, I think, for doing business with them. No, agreed. I, and I, I love the bottle. And 19206 is the hybrid, I believe you mentioned. Is there anything, and maybe it differs from bottle to bottle, but is there anything specific uh, with, the, with the hybrid that you've kind of snuck into the bottle as well, besides just the number? Uh, yeah, there is. So on the front of that bottle, there should be a percentage, an alcohol percentage. Um, and an alcohol percentage is just half of what the proof is. Um, so the proof of it is 92.06 proof. So if you multiply that percentage by two, you'll come up with 92.06. So it's kind of a little hidden gem, but it is indeed there. Uh, yeah, it's it's an Easter egg. So we can, you know, you can manipulate uh, alcohol percentages and you can manipulate proofs all you want just by adding water and diluting the uh, distilled bourbon. So we did that. We got it to a very precise point. We could kind of market our grain just a little bit more on that ball. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. Can you talk about a little bit about the the process and what it looks like and everything you've gone through uh, to get to get the bourbon in this bottle sealed and and ready to go? I know David shared some cool things with me as well, but would love to hear it from you. Yeah, I mean, and I don't know how far you want me to go back, but it obviously starts with, uh, you know, buying seed from a channel seedsman. Um, or your FSR, because David sold us the seed at the time that that stuff was bald. So, um, you know, we let it age for two years. All of the products we release now are two years. So our product sat in the barrel for two years after it was distilled. Um, and two years later, once it was finally ready, which was about August of 2022, is when it finally got mature enough that we could harvest our own channel corn. Um, that's when the fun stuff happens, because we get to go pick out uh, 
a barrel with channel corn in it. So um, we went out, David, uh, the head distiller, my uncle and I all went out to the distillery. We tapped into about 12 different barrels that had the channel product in it. And from there, we, um, you know, got to sample every single one of them, learn which ones tasted best. Um, and we actually did kind of a unique thing with this one. Uh, usually for the Pine Bluffs distilling products, it's we pull one barrel that we like, you know, we sample them all, but we choose one barrel and we bottle just that barrel. Um, so when we were doing the taste testing for this one, we couldn't quite find one that had that perfect uh, note of taste that we were looking for. Um, but, you know, all of a sudden we started kind of mixing the tasting cups together and we found two barrels that blended together, just created a delicious taste. And, you know, I think the perfect mix of um, bourbon. So we dumped two barrels together. Um, and then from there on out, we went on to the bottling process where I, we had quite a few different people from around the town come in to help donate their time to help us bottle. Um, chose a label and helped use Tara Adams to help create a label with that that had the Chael brand on it. From there, it was just delivering it to customers and showing our appreciation. That's awesome. And it really sounds like a, a true, true local journey uh, from the seed to the bottle to the customer, right? Or to the to the individual you want to give it as a gift. Uh, that that is that is such a cool path that y'all took. Was was there anything throughout that that you're like, man, this this caught me off guard? It was really challenging, or something you learned that maybe you could even apply to the seed business. What what were those kind of top things on top of mind that? Uh, you, you thought of during this process? Um, you know, part of it was just uh, kind of collaborating with so many different people. The distillery also uses its own marketing agency, which creates all of the labels for our normal products. So using um, the head distiller's expertise and which whiskeys were best, um, as well as just the channel leadership's um, advice on whether or not we should be putting their name on some whiskey. You know, getting everyone's opinion in there at the same time, uh, it seemed a bit challenging, but everyone was so helpful. It came together really well. And, you know, we didn't struggle near as much as I thought we would. That's awesome. So a little bit of organized organized chaos in some way, a little bit of. And then, hey, you know, in this virtual world, I, I'm sure that helps a little bit too, right? I mean, even today, you and I are sitting in two different states having this conversation. So that's it's pretty neat, the tools that we have to make something like this happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um the only downside I would say to the virtual world is Tara probably would have much preferred to get flown out here to go try the whiskey itself to help make this label. But I suppose the Zoom call and mailing her a bottle will work just fine. Yeah, she didn't get to sample. And I, I think that's something that's always probably the fun part, right? Um, but I, hopefully one of these times, you know, selfishly, hopefully I can invite myself to join Tara as well and and come visit y'all through the process. You know, this this this. This project demands a lot of time um, and, and the aging process that goes along with it, right? What are the aging markers ahead for the barrels and how, how does how does that whole process work and what are y'all thinking for the future? The distillery started out producing one-year-old bourbon. Um, over the last two years, we finally got to that two-year-old mark, um, which the change in flavor is just so dramatic. Um, as any bourbon lover would know, you know, you finally get to that four, eight, ten-year-old bourbon. It's just so distinct. So even getting to two-year-old bourbon has been a great increase for us. We found a huge positive to our product. Um, and now we're just trying to turn the corner and get to that four-year-old product, which I think is about eight months away. We should be bottling the first of a four-year-old product that we have. Um, the channel side of it, we're another, I would say, 12 to 14 months away from getting the first four-year-old channel barrel just because the distillery didn't start out exclusively channel. Uh, but four years is really that milestone that we're aiming for, and we're going to be happy to produce barrels that are aged longer than that. But four is really going to be the time where we can unveil how great our product can be going into the future. No, that's that's awesome. It's going to be uh, super cool to to continue to learn more about your journey here and uh, really just see where you, where you take it. I, I do got one other question that wasn't wasn't kind of written down, but when you when you pour your glass, yourself a glass of bourbon now, do you use your bourbon or do you still, are there still other bourbons that you enjoy? I use my own bourbon at home at every time I'm drinking at home at least. So, you know, you go out to a restaurant or something, 
I go to a bar that probably doesn't carry our product, I'll indulge in something else at those times. But, you know, anytime I'm at home, it's not just because we're owners or whenever of the distillery, it's because our product truly is just as good as anybody else's, I think. Um, I don't know another two-year-old bourbon, at least, that can batch out a product. So I can't believe how great it'll be when it finally gets to that four-year mark and beyond. But yeah, I I stick to ours whenever I can. That's great. Any uh, you you mentioned you know local places too earlier, right? Any local restaurants or, or bars in your area that actually do serve your bourbon? Yeah, yep. Um, you know, everywhere in my own town, all the bars, all the restaurants have it. But uh, our focus has really been widely um, in the Tri County region around us. So we've been hammering that all. In I think we're in over 250 or maybe even more than that, uh, bars and restaurants, uh, packaged liquor stores uh, throughout the state of Wyoming and mostly in that tri-state region. So we've, uh, we've been getting it out there a lot. And, you know, I think those numbers will just kind of explode when we get to that four-year-old product because people have enjoyed our product. Um, and I know they'll enjoy it even more when it gets to four. Well, hey, Chris, I, I, I'm going to put this away and save this for later. Appreciate you diving in a little bit uh, deeper with me on on the bourbon side and, and what y'all are doing from, from a local homegrown perspective, from the seed in the ground to the bottle. Uh, but let, let's start talking a little bit about, as a seedsman, what you're focusing on. And, you know, first, first fun question here, um, you're riding along in the buddy seat. What snacks are you bringing? I, I'm a big candy junkie, so it's, it's got to be something either sweet or sour. So I'm thinking Sour Patch Kids. Licorice is very shareable for that guy driving the combine. Uh, so it's got to be something in the candy aisle for sure. So you, so Sour Patch Kids is your go. It's not like a Kit Kat bar. It's definitely the the more sour candy, sour gum, anything from that perspective. Yeah, I've never found myself enjoying chocolate that much. So it's yeah, it's something on that sour side, but. What does it mean to you to be a channel seedsman? No, I think it just means providing that extra level of service uh, that growers really aren't used to, but that they should be used to. Um, so whether that's you know knowing what somebody's kids are doing out of school, or it's knowing what their ground looks like every single day of the year, because you know you grew up in that area and you're part of it. Um, it's just providing an extra level of service, really. So being involved with that grower and making them feel like you're their partner oh. in everything they do. You're not just the guy trying to come in and collect a commission check. You really want to be there and watch them succeed for no other reason than so they are successful. You're not looking out for them just because it's going to help you at the end of the day. You're looking out for them because you care about the guy next to you and you care about your neighbors. 100%. That that level of seedsmanship, right? And really, really being involved in the community. And, and you are, uh, I mean, from our previous conversation, you're, you're really partnering with a group of folks outside of selling seed too, right? But I, I love to hear how you're working with your customers and ensuring they're, they're having the best experience possible. As you think of something really rewarding that you've done as a channel seedsman, what, what are some of those experiences that you've had? Yeah. Um, so, you know, as a new a new seedsman, I haven't, you know, really had the chance to get into the field checkup series, which I'm, you know, extremely excited for for the summer. And I'm sure that'll eventually be my answer to this question. Uh, but for right now, it's just um, building connections with all of the guys I've sold seed to so far, and even the guys I haven't sold seed to. Um, building that relationship and, you know, building a layer of trust um, is really something I've been proud of myself for. Um, just because I think those relationships are going to help both of us into the future. And it was really the part of this job that I was kind of most scared about, um, is putting myself out there and talking to guys that I haven't always had the best relationship with or just didn't know very well. Um, so I think that's going to help, you know, their farm. I think it's going to help me as a seedsman and it's just going to be really beneficial to continue to grow those relationships. But that's, that's definitely been my biggest success story so far is just my ability to create relationships um, with growers and with everybody involved in the process. No, that's great. And, and you mentioned field checkup series, which is just such a great tool when when connecting with customers. And with its integration into FieldView and that collaboration from a digital perspective, you really can tell the story um, start to finish on the farm and get that much closer with your customers, which I love to hear and is great. 
You mentioned field view a bit as it can be a tough system to learn. And, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of great resources out there to help you along the way. And I think using it daily too really, really makes a different right, difference, right? And that, that's another question I got for you is how are you using field view day to day with customers? Yeah. Um, so imagery every day, you know, the more imagery you can show somebody, the more they, the more they trust in you to know their farm, the more they understand their farm themselves. But, you know, if you're getting them aerial images of, you know, plant health or, you know, water, or whatever it is, I think that really can just build a level of trust between you and the grower. And it just increases the grower's knowledge of their field, um, especially if they're not used to seeing that kind of data. Some of these farmers are, you know, already really high tech and they understand it, but they can still grow from that um, level of knowledge as well. And then there's, you know, maybe an older generation of growers out there that don't understand it at all. So, you know, providing them that climate technology is really just able, it enables them to see their farm from a whole different perspective on whether they're watering properly, on whether there's, you know, not enough uh, organic matter out there or whatever it is. I think climate just really can help push everyone beyond where they're at now. Um, so my farm uses it all the time. We use it on every planting, harvesting, and spraying operation we do. Or, and it's it's better to us as farmers, for sure. You know, just a couple couple fun ones here that I'm thinking about it as we're chit-chatting. Just, you know, more or less, which, which of these do you prefer? And and the first one that comes to mind, I'm interested to hear what you say, is Ford, Ford or Chevy? It's Chevy. We, uh, we've been farming for four generations. I don't know that we'd ever touch a Ford, even if we were broke. So, uh, <laughs> You know, even if someone was given in the way for free, we probably wouldn't on our farm. So absolutely shitty. Okay. We're good. I have a Silverado too. So it, it, it that, that makes our conversation. Maybe we should have started with this question, right? Um, what about farm dogs or barn cats? That's another easy one. I'm totally a dog guy. I, you know, I don't know. Last, I've played fetch with my cat. So yeah, I'm big dog guy. We've got three dogs running around the farm office right now. And thankfully, zero cats running around. So what kind of moisture, rain or snow? That's a tough one. That's a really tough one. I rain's always ideal because it, you know, it's usually covered during the crop season when you need it most. Um, but it can also be a lot more damaging at times too. So I'm going to go with snow just because, you know, you're eventually going to get that moisture anyways. And I can also go skiing with that snow. So I'm going to go snow. And the last one I got for you, and, and this one, you know, the Ford or Chevy one, maybe we should have started with first, but this one as well for me, I, I'm thinking I should have started with on you first too, but Apple or Android? Apple. I There's a more user-friendly, yeah, yep, Apple. Chris, is there anything I missed or anything you want to share with our viewers today um, regarding your time as a channel seedsman or everything you're doing from your distilling business? What what would you like to share with our viewers? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, the only thing I'd really like to expand on is the distillery's two slogans or one slogan combined is grade to glass and farm to flask. Um, and so that's really been the way we uh, distill, the way we market to customers, the way we treat our customers. Um, and I think Channel really kind of embodies that maybe without the bourbon side of it. Uh, but in everything Channel does, you know, it's really about go getting a full story starting, you know, with the back seed and ending with a successful harvest just like the distillery is. Um, and so that was really one of the great things about uh, giving customers that bottle of whiskey um, with channel corn in it. Because a lot of times I think growers, they put all this work in, they sell their corn and they, you know, they sell it to a local grain elevator, but they don't really know where it goes after that. They might, I mean, they can assume that it went to, you know, a feedlot or wherever, um, but they're not really positive. And the great thing about this bottle of bourbon now is they say, you know what, I grew this grain, it went into this bottle of whiskey, and now I'm enjoying, I'm reaping the harvest um, by enjoying a bottle of bourbon. So that's been really rewarding. And, you know, I just really have enjoyed the fact that Channel's entire culture and uh, the distillery slogan have tied it so well that it puts together a great full story for growers, seedsmen, um, distillers, and just everyone involved. No, that's awesome, Chris. And I, I love that journey. Uh, let me make sure I say it right. Grain to glass and farm to flask. Uh, I, I love that. I love that whole journey that, that you're going through there. And that's, that's, that's great. 
No, good deal, Chris. Well, hey, I, I really appreciate our conversation today. It's been wonderful to, to get to know you more and learn more about you as a channel seedsman and what you're doing from a bourbon perspective. You got a great journey ahead, and it, it's been an awesome conversation today. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I've really enjoyed my time as a seedsman so far. I enjoy my time on the farm, and you know, this is another great benefit to the job is getting to do this with people like you and share my story to others that are interested in farming bourbon or selling seed. Love it. Well, thanks again, Chris. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you to Chris for joining us today. I also want to thank you, our listeners. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and share this episode with a friend. This has been Around the Farm, brought to you by Climate Field View. Don't miss any of our episodes. You can follow us wherever you get podcasts. And as always, we'll see you around the farm.